Hi everyone. <clears throat> so my name is Jordan Pierce, and I work at Teradep. Today I will be presenting some of what we have been working on since I first started in 2020. So for today's presentation, we're going to start with a quick introduction to Teradep and its services, followed by a brief overview of Absolute Ocean, our new web-based ocean data portal, which is slated to be released later this summer. And then for the remainder of the presentation, we'll be talking about the progress that we've made towards automatic target recognition. So if you're not familiar, Teradep was founded by these two gentlemen, Joe Wolfman and Judge Hoffman, back in 2018. Uh, Teradep has about 30 employees, and we're based in Austin, Texas, near Lake Travis, which we use as a water testing facility. Uh, there, our bread and butter is the development of long-duration AUVs, as well as performing AUV surveys as a service, and of course, creating that web-based platform called Absolute Ocean. Uh, so there's a lot of great software out there for processing sonar data. However, we found that uh, there's still not a lot of good ways to be able to visualize and share that data with your collaborators or your clients. So we built AO in mind for ease and accessibility. You can access it whether you're on your desktop or your mobile device. There's no downloading or installation required. You just need internet connection. And then over time, we'll iteratively add additional features that will help you complete more complex tasks, such as spatial or temporal analysis, as well as have nice to have features like automatic target recognition. So if you were to hop into AO, you're immediately presented with the ability to explore the blue marble. Here you can see you're moving in towards a survey that's available to you and you're exploring the data products in 3D. And to help make the experience a little more engaging and useful, you can also uh, simultaneously click on multiple surveys so you can see them all at the same time. And then with regards to geospatial tools, we're also developing some. Here you're seeing the ability to measure area and some crack, um, some, SAS, some crack and SAS data, sorry. And also the ability to do vertical profiling. So here you're seeing vertical exaggeration and creating a vertical profile over some gridded bathymetry data, as well as the adjacent terrain. But the most important feature is the ability to upload your own data. So you as a user should be able to think of AO as sort of a geo Dropbox, where you take your entire uh, survey project and all of your files and upload them, some of which are supported for visualization. So you can see that ASCII, XYZ, GeoTIFF, and LAS can currently be displayed in 3D. Um, the data that is currently on AO comes from one or two sources. So either Teradep, so from the vehicle that we're using during testing time, or using one of our Taliban Gavias, which are rated to do like one meter to a thousand meter depth, um, as well as pulling in data from public sources. So like NOAA, JEPCO, and USGS to name a few, as well as hosting other companies' private data, such as T-Carta, so their users can see the data before making the purchase. Um, and then oftentimes people ask, you know, what kind of data can you bring into AO? And really we can bring in any type of data as long as it can be represented in one of the file formats that I uh, previously mentioned. Um, so here's an example of a couple of modalities. Uh, so from this point on, I'm going to pivot and focus more on automatic target recognition. And here is a great graphical representation of what that is. So we're looking at a 3D point cloud that is color-coded, where blue represents a low elevation and red is high elevation. And you can see that we have objects of interest encapsulated inside of green bounding boxes, which is represented by the current truth. And then we have red bounding boxes, which are predictions. <coughs> So why ATR? Well, as you know, hydrographers collect large volumes of data, and that means that the conventional practice of manually identifying targets is no longer scalable. And oftentimes when people hear large volumes of data and automation, their mind goes towards machine learning, because it's already shown success in other fields, such as self-driving cars, facial recognition, and diagnosing some cancers. However, there's actually some obstacles to using machine learning for the purpose of ATR, and ironically, it's data availability. So a uh, meta-analysis published in 2020 found that there are very few large, well-curated data sets made available to the public for the purpose of ATR. And those that do exist are either too small or they're not representative of the real-world environment. And I know what you're thinking. We're hydrographers, we collect terabytes of data for every single survey, but in reality, only a small percentage of that might actually be used for the purpose of ATR. And although hydrographers do a fantastic job of creating contact reports, most of the time, the annotations that they create, point annotations, don't contain the geometries necessary for training a machine learning algorithm. So when I first started Teradep, I thought that I would need to build models. But after starting, I realized what I needed to do first was to build a very large comprehensive data set since currently none really exists. However, there's some conditions that you need to consider when building one of these data sets. First, 
you need a lot of data, ideally as many unique samples as possible, and for them to be representative of the real world environment in which you intend to deploy your model. And because we're pouring the ACR, we need data that has a high enough spatial resolution to be able to discern individual objects of interest. And for the sake of convenience, you want your data to be clean and in a consistent format. Um, so after spending a bit of time looking at different data sources, I ultimately set, settled on NOAA's NOS hydrographic survey data, which if you're not familiar, is actually used for mapping coastlines and EEZs. Uh, so from this data source, we're actually pulling the bathymetry data, which has spatial resolutions as low as 0.5 meters to about 2 meters, which, most of which are stored inside of bathymetric attributed grids or bag files. But the real reason why we sort of settled on this particular data set is because for each survey, there's a descriptive report which contains detailed information of each object identified by trained hydrographers and useful metadata that could serve as the basis for creating labels. So this was a potential gold mine for me. So we got to scraping and uh, we downloaded all data from 2000 to 2020. Uh, you can see here in AO the cyan dot represent all of the individual surveys around the US. And from this collection, we identified which actually contained at least one object of interest. So we developed some code to scrape all of the metadata from the descriptive reports and output about 13,000 point annotations, which served as the basis for creating fitted polygons. Uh, in total, we've got 45,000 of those. And I know that there's a discrepancy between the number of point annotations and the number of objects labeled, and that's because sometimes there will be a one-to-one -one ratio of point annotations. You have one point and one object as seen with a rep, and sometimes you have a single point in a field of objects as you can see here with the fish haven. So we created labels actually in 2D from a bird's eye perspective, and you can see that we created fitted polygons. And the reason why is because from this, we could programmatically create rotated or axis aligned bounding boxes or segmentation maps. You can use semantic segmentation, which is per pixel level classification. And although we did it in 2D, because we're working with bathymetry data, we can easily project that into 3D to create 3D bounding boxes, as well as 3D segmentation maps. So we have these types of labels for all 45,000 uh, objects of interest. Now, as I said before, there's not a whole lot of data that is available for the purpose of ATR made available to the public. And unfortunately, we can't release all of our data at this time, but we are releasing a very small subset to serve as a benchmark for those who are interested. Uh, the data that we're using is actually uh, coming from Survey H12891, which is near Jamaica Bay, New York. It covers an area about 45 kilometers squared, and in total, we have about 3,000 labeled objects, though for our experiment, we're only focusing on uh, about a thousand of those, which are highly suspect of being wrecks. Uh, in our experiment, we have two very simple questions. Uh, the first is, does increasing the depth of your deep learning model increase model performance? Because the rule of thumb is more difficult problems may need models with more parameters. So to do this, we simply vary the encoder, which has different levels or different amounts of parameters. So it's either efficient at B0, B2, or B4. Now the second question is, uh, can a model perform better if it is trained from scratch, or if it is fine-tuned using weights previously trained on optical data? And to me, this is a more interesting question because we're using bathymetry data, not optical data. So to do this, we simply vary the weights. We either start with randomized weights, or we use weights that were previously trained on an image at, on a data set called the ImageNet data set or we use weights that are increasingly trained on an even larger data set, and those are called noisy student. Now, with regard to training, uh, we chose to represent our 3D bathymetry data as 2D BEMs and scale the bathymetric values to be between zero and 255 to act like an image so that we could use those other weights. Uh, with regards to training, we actually chose to use a UDEC architecture, which is actually for performing <coughs> semantic segmentation. However, we could use OpenCV to create rotated bounding boxes to sort of simulate object detection as well. With data augmentation, we did the normal flip-flops and rotations as well as varied the resolution of our training samples to be between 0.5 and 1 or 2 meters. And then we also performed capable cross-validation. Now this is a machine learning technique that is used to help reduce model bias. This is actually really important. So what we did is we took our survey and we divided it to five distinct, non-overlapping geographical areas where each area has roughly 200 or so objects. 
And we did this for five folds. So for the first fold, you can imagine we're using area one, two, and three as training data, area four as validation, and area five as testing. Then for fold two, we would switch it up. Area two, three, and four would be training, five would be validation, and one would be testing, and so on and so forth for every single combination, taking the results from all the test sets and then averaging them together to get the final scores. <coughs> So from here, I'm actually gonna hop straight into the results. So you can see on the left-hand side, we have our metrics. We have precision recall, dice, and intersection over union. These four are calculated as a segmentation task. The other three, which have asterisks, are calculated as if it was doing object detection. So we've got precision recall and mean average precision. And again, uh, it's just slightly differently how you calculate it depending on how you see the predictions. Now for each metric, we have a diverging color scheme where green represents high scores and red represents low scores for each metric. Now, if we remove the final box, kind of take a look, along the x-axis, we're mostly looking at the increasing number of parameters, so from B0 to B4. And if you squint your eyes and kind of tilt your head, you kind of see that a trend seems to suggest that as you increase the depth of your model, most scores tend to increase. Now, we can take the same results and vary how it looks. So now we're looking at it per weights. So again, we're starting with weights trained from scratch or using uh, weights previously trained on optical data. And again, you can see that this trend tends to suggest that uh, training on data or using weights that are previously trained on optical data makes models that perform slightly better. And this is the last way of doing it. And I apologize for this monstrosity of a table, but you can see on the y-axis we're increasing in depth, and again x-axis we're changing the weights. And that trend sort of tends to suggest the same. So from this very small experiment, uh, we found that, yeah, increasing the encoder's depth or increasing the number of parameters helps model performance, as well as, you know, counterintuitive maybe, using weights that were previously trained on optical data actually made a model perform better. Now again, this is a very small subset. Um, we have much more data that we're currently working on, but there are other variables that are worth considering. So the size of the data set is extremely important. Uh, as well as the data representation and the dimensionality. And I bring these up because these are things that we're currently working on, just not finished yet. So in conclusion, uh, we've shown here that yes, bathymetry data can be useful for ATR in addition to size scan and SAS, which is something we're currently working on with sonar waves. And that also, yes, open source architectures as well as pre-trained weights can help you develop a model for ATR. But more importantly, a sort of take home message is that I think we as a community would benefit more if we were to release more data to the public to serve as benchmark data sets. So we will reap the benefits of ATR once we create more benchmark data sets. Um, closely to that, uh, acknowledgements, thanks to CHS, and then also Teradep and Seagate, uh, and I'm Eric for everything we've done, uh, some references, and uh, I think I don't have, maybe a little bit of time for questions, but if, if you want, uh, you can check us out at Boots Health um, Thank you, Jordan. Well done. <laughs>
All right, our next talk will be on cleaning out lawyers and bathrooms.